Hello class, good morning and welcome to this video tutorial. This morning we are considering audio fundamentals. So let's get our ass together and move on. Now, when we talk of audio, we are talking about sound. And sound is a form of energy that is normally produced from a vibrating source and is through an elastic medium and normally is the ear that is used to detect. It is the brain's interpretation of electrical pulses being sent by the inner ear through the nervous system. So normally when you speak, what happens is that the sound goes through the air, performing simple harmonic motion, set the ear, uh, the air in the ear into vibration, and then these vibrations, there are pulses, that is some bones in the ear that detects them in the form of a sound and is sent into the brain for interpretation. So uh, normally it travels in the form of series of compression and refraction. Compression means the air pressure becomes high at a point and then becomes lower at another point. So it's elastic, it's like expand, compress, expand, compress as it travels through the air. So it creates what we call points of high pressure and low pressure in the medium through which it travels. Now, the main study of sound is called acoustic and is a branch of physics, okay, that studies sound. And sound is measured in decibels. Normally, the actual unit is bell, but bell is so uh, big a unit, so we normally use the deci, one over ten of a bell as a unit of sound. So audio is sound within the acoustic range available to humans. So you see, when we talk of sound, the frequency ranges from, let's say, 1 up to about 20 kilohertz. Um, it's even above that, about 25 kilohertz going to the outer sound. But the ear is capable of listening to only a range of frequency. At very low, the ear cannot hear. And at very high, the ear cannot accept it. And the extreme high frequency sound is what we use in Altria sound scan for detecting pregnancies and other things at the laboratories. So when we talk of audio frequency, we are talking about a frequency that is available to the human ear. Can the ear can hear and interpret it to the brain. So it can provide the listening pressure, uh, pleasure of music, the startling ascent of special effects or ambience of a mood setting background. Like when you go to movies, we hear the background sounds and other things. These are within the range of audio frequency. Now, we have two main categories of sound. The first one is called content sound. And content sound provides information to your audience. For example, when you're watching a movie, the dialogue between the Jaco and the Wayne is content sound. And mm -hmm, so all the kind of sound that really communicates to the listener about something, that is a content sound. Then we have the ambient. And these ambients are normally consistent of background and sound effects. These ambient sound can be sometimes nuisance, but sometimes it could be a message reinforcement. So let's look into details of these categories. When we talk of uh, content sound, the first type of content sound we mentioned here is narration. And narration provides information about an animal, uh, that's animation, that is playing on the screen. So um, when you play animation, you only create certain uh, features. They appear to be moving on the screen, but it's actually human beings that speak. So whatever they say is just a narration about what is going on. And then we have testimonials. These, and uh, let me go back to the narration. Sometimes even in some movies, when the movie is shown, you see that someone is telling the story. Okay? The one telling the story could be part of the movie or sometimes not part of the movie. I will be giving episodes about what went on and so on and so forth. So testimonials could be the auditory or video soundtracks used in presentation of movies. So normally the soundtrack behind a movie or like what I'm doing now, if I play music at the background. And then at the end of the day, we also have voiceovers. And these are used for short instructions, for example, to navigate multimedia applications. So here, music 
may be used to communicate as in a song. Uh, sometimes, if you take, for instance, the Akan tradition, most of our music tells a story. So though you'll be listening to the beats and other things, but you'll be listening to a whole lot of story about an episode that sometimes is really interesting. So these are voiceovers. And in, in, in voiceovers, sometimes you could have a short note of voice educating you about something. Press here. Press here. They are, they are within voiceovers and um, normally used for very short instructions during it. Then we have ambient sound. The first type of ambient sound is a background sound you hear in real life, such as a football match. I mean, Manchester, uh, Chelsea playing. And hear the crowd. Yay! Sometimes even the commentator's voice is lost in the background. Okay, that's a message reinforcement. When the crowds go here, then you know that the match is getting interesting. When the stadium becomes very quiet, then you see that there is some sort of tension. Okay, so message reinforcement in the form of background noise mm -hmm, normally go to reinforce a message or one that one wishes to communicate. Then we have background music. Normally set the mood for audience to receive and process information by starting and ending the presentation with the music. So sometimes somebody is coming to do a presentation and he has a very nice choir. Okay, they will give a nice redemption and then everybody become attentive for the one uh, for the presenter to actually set up. And sometimes when it's ending to it will end with some nice music. Yeah. So these are background music. And then we have sound effects. Sound effects are used in presentation to live in up the mood and add effects to your presentation. So sometimes you can create an effect and play the music alongside, okay? Such as sound attack to bulleted list, okay? Just to give certain emphasis and make it appear nice. So these are all ambient sound and you can see that they are some, of, some sort of background sound. Now let's talk briefly about properties of sound. First of all, a sound travels in a form of a simple harmonic motion. That is a sine wave variation. And when it moves that way, you know, anything moving in a sine wave variation, it travels up, down to a threshold, take the opposite direction and the rest. So a sound, though it's a longitudinal wave, but normally when we sketch, we sketch in a form of a transverse where it, it, it takes a sine variation. Because of that, it has a maximum, a peak of it, and a minimum peak. This maximum or minimum displacement of the wave particle is called the amplitude of the sound. Now, when we take every sound has a frequency, and the frequency here is the number of complete cycles the sound makes in a second. Okay? And frequency is measured in hertz. Because I told you it's a, it's a some sort of sinusoidal wave, a sine wave variation. When it begins from the threshold, goes up, come to the same point, takes the opposite direction, goes down, come to the same point. It has completed one cycle. So such number of cycles the sound completes in one second is called a frequency. The wavelength is the distance covered by the sound in one cycle. It is normally measured in meters. So normally wavelength is um, represented by the symbol lambda. Frequency is measured in, that is frequency is normally represented by the symbol F, measured in hertz. So wavelength could be in meters, could be in centimeters or whatever it is, but the actual SI unit for wavelength is in meters. Now let's look at period. A period is the time taken to complete one wavelength. Okay? A time taken to complete one wavelength. I've told you, when the sound goes through maximum, minimum, come to the threshold, then it's one complete wavelength. The time taken to do that is called the period. And then we have the bandwidth. The bandwidth is defined as the differences between the highest and the lowest frequencies contained in that signal. So for instance, a sound wave may consist of several frequencies put together, but 
a signal which spans the range of let's say 200 hertz to about 3200 hertz has a bandwidth of that difference which is 3200 minus 200 giving you 300 hertz so in effect bandwidth takes the difference in the frequency that between the highest and the lowest frequency ranges within the sound now the velocity of sound is not constant like that of electromagnetic wave where you can have the velocity to be three times 10 to the power eight meters per second for all what um electromagnetic wave no sound wave the velocity depends on the medium through which it travels and it's normally because of certain factors so velocity of sound in air will be different from velocity of sound in a particular metal and but in all velocity is given by the frequency of the sound times the wavelength and is measured in meters per second so forget about what is written here in terms of the unit. it is meters per second so that is the general so this is the general equation of a wave velocity is equal to frequency times the wavelength now let's look at some of the characteristics of sound that right. this is about few theoretical aspects of sound that we are dealing with now the loudness of sound is a sensation in the individual minds and it depends on the intensity of sound now when we talk of intensity of the sound is the amount of sound per unit area perpendicular to that area when we talk of loudness it depends on the intensity that's the amount of sound energy hitting an area per second loudness we say is a sensation in the individual mind because what is louder to you may not be louder to me let's take two people one works at a factory where machines are always running high and then the other works in a banking environment when where the environment is always quiet in such places the ear becomes so sensitive that even the drop of a needle can be heard but in the factory the sound is so loud that if you want to speak to one another you need to shout so that when you miss these people outside you see the one who works at the factory even when he's talking normal he'll be shouting you need to shout before he hears the one at the bank even a whisper he can still hear so between the two the loudness of a sound a sound now may be louder to the bank manager or bank worker will be so little for the one the factory worker so that's why we say that loudness is a sensation in the individual mind the other characteristics is the pitch and when we say the pitch it is how high or how low a sound is on a musical scale and it normally depends on the frequency a high frequency sound is produced by an object that is vibrating faster and vice versa that is a low frequency sound is produced by an object that is vibrating slowly let's take a corn mill when you are beginning the corn mill and it is turning slowly you see ka, ka, ka. but as the speed pick up then, ka, 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 then you hear, hear oh so the sound becomes very high so we are saying that the pitch depends on frequency if the frequency is slow or low the pitch is less if the frequency is high the pitch is high okay so an object ro pro uh, rotating faster will provide a high pitch while that of rotating slower will provide a low pitch now the last character we need to talk about is the quality or the timbre and this is the characteristics of sound that distinguishes one sound from the other played on the same musical scale few objects produce sound of a single frequency others produce sound that are made of different frequencies and they come together so in this case what happened is that there is a fundamental frequency and the rest become um, an integral multiples of that fundamental frequency and we call those harmonics okay so when um, let's say a quartet sings they produce a fundamental frequency and that of harmonics it blends the music and make it very nice like that of an a cappella song uh, okay so um we have the fundamental and that normally some people's song or when you play sound from different musical instruments one produce more harmonic than the other and that makes the music richer so you see 
if you play the same note from, let's say, a C on a piano, but different piano, the same C will produce a different sound. A lady singing alto, the sound will still be different from a man singing the same alto. The idea is that ladies' voice are normally richer as compared to men. So a timbre or quality is some sort of character that differentiate two sounds played, play, or that is played on the same on different machines. One is richer than the other because of the number of harmonics that is produced. Now let's see. Multimedia sounds are, are that is a um, system sounds are assigned to various systems, events such as startups and warnings, among others. So normally, if you take different machines like Mac, provides several system sound options such as what glass, indigo, laugh, and the rest. In Windows, we have sounds include start, work, synth, and chord one, and so on and so forth. So multimedia sounds is either digital totally recorded in a form of a MIDI, okay, or in an audio format. So we'll look at, let's look at what we call digital audio. Normally, sound in nature is analog. When I speak, my sound initially, I said that travels in a form of simple harmonic variation of the air, causing refraction, compression of the air as it travels. It's simple harmonic and is in the form of analog wave. In fact, here I should have had a marker to really draw the diagram for you to see. So um, for computers and other digital machines to process them, you need to convert from uh, that is analog to digital. So we need what we call to digitize or sample. And for digitization, the first thing you do is to sample the sound and then quantize them. So digital audio is an actual representation of sound stored in a form of what? Samples. So let's look at what is meant by sampling. Samples represent the amplitude or loudness of sound at a discrete point in time. So here, this is what we do. In sampling, you take various points of the sound at a particular time interval, okay? So quality of digital recording depends on the sampling rate. That is the amount of sampling you do per second. Or that is what we call the frequency of sampling. The number of samples taken per second, just like I just mentioned. And the process of converting analog to signal, to digital signal is called digitization. And digitization is made up of two processes, sampling and quantization. Let's look at them. So when we talk of sampling, Sampling is the process of taking particular points of the sound at time intervals. So how much information is stored per sample is called the sampling size. So higher sampling rates allow waveforms to be more ac accurately represented. The idea is this. If you sample at a faster rate, that means you almost take everything in the sample. But if you sample slowly, you leave a lot of gaps in between and the sound is not normally rich. So the three sampling frequencies most often used in multimedia are the CD quality. And on the CD quality, we're talking about 44.1 kilohertz. That means the sound is sampled 44,100 times per second. So fast or 22,050 times per second. That's 22.05 kilohertz. And 11,025 times per second. So the number of bits used to describe the amplitude of sound waves when sampled determine the sample size. It's not that we can use 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, and the like. So 8 bits sampling size provide 256 bits to describe dynamic range of amplitude. The idea is this. If it is 8 bits, then the sample size is given by 2 to the power 8. So 2 to the power 8 is 256. Check it out. Let's see. Okay. A 16-bit sample size provides over 65,000. That's 2 to the power 16. And then the, if it's 32, then it will become 2 to the power 32. So that's how it goes. So 
Let's look at these figures. Let's look at these figures. This is a sound representation that I just mentioned to you. It goes in the form of simple harmonic variation. It travels to the maximum in the positive direction, come to the equilibrium point, take the minimum direction, and then return to it. So this is one wavelength. That's why we label from here to that end as one wavelength. Points of maximum amplitude are called crest. Points of minimum amplitudes are called trough. So this is amplitude, maximum displacement from the mean position. That's how sound travels as it goes through a medium. Look at this, 64 samples per second. This is 64. So if you're doing this, the sample size will be two to the power 64. Look at, so it means that you take almost the entire wavelength. This one will become rich. But one disadvantage is that the whatever wave sound wave produced will be larger. The higher the sample size, then the larger the file it creates. So there's 32 samples, 16 sample sizes, and then eight samples. Look at the eight sample. It's almost like a square wave. It means you take only a small portion of the sampling rate, and that becomes uh, the sound will not become rich. Normally, when you play, it sounds flat. And, and so on and so forth. But the higher one, when you play, it sounds what well, very nice because it has almost all the component of the real world sound as you produce it. Now let's look, look at the process, a typical analog to digital conversion process. You take the sound signal from the environment. Because the, you take it from the environment, it normally comes with a lot of noise because, I don't know, when I started this video, you could hear the call crowing, people shutting the door, cars blowing their horns. In most cases, all these frequencies add up to the sound. So at the first equipment you fit into, what you do is that you do filtering by removing unwanted what? Unwanted sounds, and then you do anti-aliasing filter. Anti-aliasing is removing frequencies that are not within the acoustic range, okay? So that you get the pure sound having the acoustic or the sound audio frequency range. After that, you put it into a machine that samples it. Take various snapshots. This is a sampling. Take various snapshots of the signal, and then it holds it. The quantization and coding, that is where the signals you take converts them to binary coding. So zeros and ones and stored on the actual process. So that is the processes involved in analog to digital conversion. So the sound that you produce normally converted to binary codes and store on the hard disk or any storage media you are using. Now let's look at this. So the value of each sample is rounded off to a nearest integer. That is when you sample, you take digital snapshots of the sound and therefore you run them the nearest integer, either one or zero, and so on. So quantization can produce unwanted background hazing noise, and clipping may be severely distorted the sound. So normally you have it. When you clip, it makes the sound flat by cutting off the maximum amplitude, and therefore it makes the sound very flat. So this is the original waveform. When you clip, this is how it goes, and it's not good for audio recording. Okay, so you need to avoid clipping. Now let's look at some of the theories we use at the studio. The first one is Nyquist theorem and aliasing. Nyquist theorem states that sampling frequency for a signal must be at least twice the highest frequency component in the signal. In other words, if you have a sound wave that is, let's say, 2 kilohertz, then that is a that is the maximum signal component. Then if your sampling size sound, you must use four kilohertz twice the highest frequency component. Okay, so you're saying that the amount of sampling you do must be twice the highest frequency component of the signal. So for example, if we are using a CD quality, sampling rate is equal to 44 point one kilohertz or 44,100 hertz. Nyquist is saying that then the frequency should be, because we are saying that the frequency should be twice the sampling rate. 
uh, should be what? Half of the sampling rate, because I said the sampling rate should be twice the highest frequency. So if the sampling rate is twice the highest frequency and the sampling rate is 44, then the Nyquist frequency becomes sampling rate over two, which is 22,050 hertz. I was clear. Because when you add this as the highest component, then you get twice of this, you get the 44.1. That would be the sampling rate. So the same thing applies as we have here. So sampling rate of 22, the highest frequency, which is the Nyquist frequency, will be 11,025. So frequencies above the Nyquist frequency is a fold over, and it's called aliasing. Okay, so aliasing frequency F is normally within the range of the sampling frequency and the sampling rate. Sampling frequency is sampling rate over 2, and then the sampling rate. So it becomes F prime. So F prime becomes F minus the sampling rate. So for example, if the sampling rate is 20 hertz, then Nyquist frequency equals to 10, that is, please, this is 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. Then Nyquist frequency becomes 10,000 hertz. Okay, so here, let's, let's look at this because in this case, if you subtract um, let's come back. So here, we're saying that sampling rate, giving you sampling rate of 20 hertz. First, Nyquist frequency is 10,000 hertz. Okay? That is it, because you have to divide this by 2. When you take aliasing frequency, here the frequency is equal to 12,000 hertz. We are still keeping the sampling rate the same. Then, the Nyquist frequency becomes 20,000 minus 12,000, which is 8,000 hertz. If we take the other frequency to be 18,000 hertz, sampling rate is 2,000. So when you subtract, you get 2,000. If your aliasing frequency is 20,000, then if you subtract the what? sampling frequency, you get zero. So there is no aliasing at all. So that is how we do the calculation. Okay? Because we say this is SR over 2 and then that. It should be within that range. Now let's talk a brief about fidelity. Fidelity is defined as, a pro, um, as the closeness of the recorded vision, uh, version of the original sound. I mean, if you take like my voice, let's say this, the voice is about 10,000 hertz. And then after you put it through a recording, you take the sampling and convert it to digital. And then you find out that it's close to about 18,500 hertz. It means that it's so close to the original version, which is 20, or that is, oh, no, let's say, my original voice is 10,000 hertz. When you sample and record the sound, it was about 10,500. It means it is so close to the original. In such case, we say it is of high fidelity. So when you record a sound and do everything, if the one you recorded is so close to the original sound produced, then it is called a high fidelity sound. If it is far away, then it is a low fidelity sound, okay? So a really high fidelity, we call it high fire recording, takes up a lot of memory because it's so close to the original. Um, it's about 176.4 kilobytes for every second of audio, hmm, of stereo quality, sampled at 16 bit, 44.1 kilohertz per channel. So fortunately, for most computer multimedia applications, it is not very necessary to tune it to high fidelity because the machine has a way of filtering it to make it quality, close to the original. Okay, so let's, the, the crucial aspect of preparing digital audio files are First, you balance the need for sound quality against the available RAM and hard disk uh, space. And then setting the appropriate recording levels to get a high quality and clean recording. After this video, I'll give you a particular link. You have to watch that video. It's more than an hour video, but it will teach you how to set up a recording studio and all the equipment you need, the software you require to run such a studio, okay? So take note, it could be a nice way of uh, starting something like 
a sound recording for musical recording and other recordings that is uh, we normally use in our daily activities. So let's look at what we call sound, uh, that is signal to noise ratio. Every sound wave you record from nature comes with certain noise backgrounds. For instance, I'm using computer to record. Even the computer itself can generate a background noise. The earphone mm, consists of certain magnets and other things in there can generate small amount of noise within. People shouting from outside can generate noise. So normally, noise is attached with real world sound. But then, how much noise is in a particular amount of sound? That's what we call signal to noise ratio. If you have so much sound as compared to small amount of noise, then signal to noise ratio becomes very high. And when it is high, it gives you good quality sound. If signal to noise ratio is low, then it means that your sound is poor. Okay, so that's the meaning. Okay, and it's given by 10 log to the base 10 power of what signal to the power of noise in terms of amplitude it is given by 10 in terms of amplitude it is given by 20 log to the base 10 um into bracket amplitude of the signal to the amplitude of noise and they are expressed in decibels because the, the fact is, power is related to amplitude by what? A squared. So normally when you convert, the square makes this one 20. Okay, that is why this one becomes 20 log 10. And this one is 10 log 10. When you use power, and here yeah, you will use what? Amplitude. So we've defined all the parameters over here. Let's look at one of the calculations I use. So for example, a sound signal has an input power of 25 watts and a noise component of 5 watts. What would be the signal to noise ratio so we call we use power we say 10 to the power uh, log 10 power of signal to power of noise so 10 log 10 to the power that is uh 25 over 5 and you need to 10 log to the base 10 of what 5 that is when you divide 25 by 5 and it will give you 1 point something when you multiply it with 0 point something when you multiply it by Sorry, you multiply it by 10, you get 7 decibels. So that becomes your signal to noise ratio. You can try one with um, amplitude instead of power. Okay, so that one, you 20 log to the power base 10, amplitude of signal over amplitude of noise. And that will give you the, so this one is a trial for you. Look at it, you write it, you try it on your own. Okay, let's look at file size. How do you calculate the size of a sound recording? In fact, in recording, we have two main types, either in mono or stereo. So mono recordings are fine, but tend to sound a bit flat. Okay, normally mono is not, because it takes only one channel, and it's a bit flat, as it doesn't sound nice to the ear. It's not interesting. Stereo sound requires twice much storage space as mono because it uses two channels and it, it takes the size twice that of a mono. So that is it. So let's look at this. For you to record a sound or calculate the size of a sound recording, we take the sampling rate times the duration of the recording times the bit resolution over eight because we have to calculate it in bytes. And then you multiply by one, that is if it's mono. If it's stereo, you multiply it by two because of the two channel. So let's take one example. For instance, for a 10 second sound recording at 22.05 kilohertz, eight bit resolution monophonic, the size will be 22,050 times 10 seconds, then eight over eight, because that is, we said we divide the bit resolution by eight multiply by one, and that would be 22,500 bytes, okay? And normally good for speech, okay? You can convert this one to megabytes by dividing it by 
two four times one zero two four. I mean, you only divide it, that's what you get. So let's take another one. For stereo recording of the same sound, okay? For 10 seconds of good music quality at 44.1, that's CD quality, 16 bit resolution stereo. You have the sampling rate, that is 44,100 kHz by 10, that is the what? The uh, 10, that is the seconds time. And then 16 bit resolution over 8, meaning 2 bytes. Multiply by 2, that is 2 channel because it's stereo. And it will give you that value 1000, oh, that is 1,764,000 bytes. So you can convert this one to megabytes by dividing it by 1024 times 1024 to get equivalent in megabytes. Okay, so for tools, we have a lot of tools that we use to record sound. In our next lesson, I'll take you through video uh, tutorials of how to record and edit sound. For the meantime, I want you to watch these links I've provided here. They provide you with various tools. In fact, the two I consider, we have so many of them, but the one used at the studio currently, you can get it cheap, download it free, is Audacity. And you can watch how to use Audacity to record and edit sound using this channel on YouTube. Another one is here. So I'll send you both of this video recording and that of the slides so that you can actually copy these links and work them. I provided another link here. Uh, and this link, I just don't want you to watch. Download it. It's about an hour, over an hour long video. And it teaches you all the equipment necessary to set up an audio studio for you to run sound recording and what? Editing and all the necessary things you need in music. I hope this uh, video is in, has been good and I want you to watch and ask your questions, necessary questions as we go along. Thank you for watching. God bless you. Hmm.